Thanks, Dan. Welcome to the Penn Museum. The concept of monumentality has been central to archaeology since its beginning. Monuments are the subject of thousands of coffee table books on archaeology and important for archaeology courses that we teach our students. Massive amounts of stone, brick, earth are considered the physical manifestations of centralized governments and effective political economies. To V. Gordon Child, monumental architecture was one of the key defining traits of civilization. In most archaeologists' minds, monumentality is a physical manifestation of a complex hierarchical and centralized authority. Large-scale monument construction in prehistoric societies lacking written records are generally assumed to be associated with states and civilizations. According to Bruce Trigger, the impracticality of monuments is their intended message. In simple cost-benefit analysis, monuments are colossal waste of time and energy that could be dedicated to food production, shelter, and security. Monuments are highly visible potent symbols of the elite's ability to mobilize and administer labor of the commoners that they control. Monuments are of a scale and often complexity of design and engineering that goes beyond the necessary for serving the basic needs of the peoples that built them. Monuments are considered by some to be these visible symbols of wealth and power materialized. In traditional, the traditional assumption was that monuments were associated only with states, um, complex hierarchical political organization. Although some archaeologists agree that non-state societies can build monumental works. As archaeologists, we know monumentality when we see it. Monumentality is usually defined by an arbitrary definition with references to its size, specific building materials, or comparative aesthetics. In rare cases, monuments are evaluated using energetic studies and experimental archaeology that can inform us better about the labor that was invested in them. Archaeologists, historians, and art historians of each world culture area have their own vision of what is considered monumentality. In a recent edited volume by Richard Berger and Robert Rosewing and some other colleagues, they survey monumental construction in a wide range of societies, uh, both state and non-state, within the Americas. As the editors point out, the low earthen mound of one culture area, considered to be monumental, might be questioned by scholars working in another part of the world that has uh, what they would consider um, monuments with more work that were used to build them or possibly more aesthetically pleasing. In a seminal and somewhat cynical tongue-in-cheek article in the 1990s by Bruce Trigger, he proposed that prehistoric monumentality is characterized by its impractical, non-productive use of energy of the subjects by the elite classes to create great works of engineering, art, and scale. As highly visible constructions, these monumental works serve ideological functions that demonstrate the power of societies to conspicuously consume energy. According to Trigger and Joyce Marcus, monuments tend to be the most impressive at the dawn of states in terms of their scale and the actual available populations to build them, rather than in later societies with more resources at their command. Why would this be? Because leaders in these societies are more insecure about their powers over their subjects and the potential subjects and actually try harder. In Andean archaeology, the other hat that I wear, Monumentality is considered a physical correlate of the appearance of a complex society. For the Southern Andes, we are told that elite public architecture first appears in the early horizon and early intermediate period as stone-faced platforms with sunken temple courts like these. Through the lens of cultural evolution, the increasing scale and amount of labor invested in monumental buildings is correlated with increasing social complexity. Amazonia and the humid tropics are not what one thinks of when discussing monumentality. Of course, we are all familiar with the tropical forest monuments and civilizations of the Maya in Mexico, in Guatemala, or Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Traditionally, 
we thought that tropical regions, such as Amazonia, did not have the resources to build great wonders. I collect lots of these images, like these, um, I think they're sort of spectacular for capturing sort of the emotion of the tropical forests, in this case of Brazil in Amazonia. And you can see the artist is playing around a little bit with scale. He says there's little itsy bitsy people like ants there and the trees are much larger. But it does give you this impression of the sort of untouched landscape that we all love and appreciate today for its biodiversity and native cultures. But I think sometimes these images, you know, this one's over 100 years old, stick in our, our heads, um, not just the public, but also my colleagues, thinking that it's always been this way and um, that not much really happened in tropical areas such as Amazonia. And part of this is um, a longstanding tradition of looking at the limitations of what, what nature can provide. And so people often point to poor soils, and in the case of Amazonia, uh, technology, agricultural farming technology called slash and burn or Swidden agriculture that requires the cutting down of the forest, small plots usually, and you plant for a couple of years, and then you quote unquote abandon the field and move on to a new plot. And um, this requires large areas of forest for people to survive, and you move your villages around the landscape over time. And it's not conducive for establishing large villages, cities, and things that are the basis of most civilizations. And um, the technology that these peoples used um, was pretty simple. If you look at early civilizations through many parts of the world, they have much more sophisticated use of metals and other objects to make work easier to do the kinds of things that we recognize as civilization. Um, most of the digging tools used for agriculture were simple sharpened stakes of hard wood that sometimes had fire hardened tips on them. But we do know from a lot the archaeological record, going back to some of the first explorations, people collecting objects in Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, and other Amazonian countries, of an incredible pottery technology. And why pottery? Well, it's the only thing that's preserved in most sites in a, in a human climate. And um, one thing you notice, and they noticed also when they were collecting these things, these are huge vessels. So these are considered to be, they're ceramic coffins. Some of them stand this tall. And this is not the kind of thing that hunters and gatherers or small simple societies would produce and lug around you know, if they were doing slash and burn agriculture. And um, also, and these are sort of art pieces of art, but we also have cooking vessels, brewing vessels for making chicha or manioc beer that are huge, indicating they're serving lots of people and holding big parties, and probably we infer from those there were lots of people gathered together. We also have evidence from linguistics, and so if you trace out all of the Amazonian groups, the multitude of languages that they speak today and in the historic period, many of these have been lost, we can kind of reconstruct through historical linguistics the movements of these peoples, and they were very cosmopolitan. You had groups of people that were moving across the main valleys, settling them, farming, and then other groups would push them out later, speaking different languages in many cases, and we can document some of this in the pottery styles that the archaeologists are working with. Another couple wake-up calls for us um, is a phenomenon called uh, terra preta, or Amazonian dark earth, and it's a phenomenon that's been found in other parts of the world, but primarily in the central Amazon. And these are jet black, greasy, organic soils that we find that have no business being there. It, and you can see the contrast in the image on the right, James Peterson there, showing a pot, big urn coming out of the riverbank, and the black soil above, and then the traditional sort of Amazonian, that really horrible, non-productive stuff, you see that orange stuff there. And this stuff is so valuable that in the, the big cities along the central Amazon that feed the markets of Belém, Manaus, Santarém, um, big urban centers, um, many of the farmers, the truck farmers, operate these things and they get incredible harvests out of this. This is a papaya uh, plantation with two of my colleagues, uh, Brazilian colleagues, and showing the contrast between these human-created soils and the um, 
of the natural soils. And what they're doing is they're incorporating all kinds of organic matter intentionally and literally tons and tons and tons of charcoal that has all kinds of magical characteristics of changing soil, providing all kinds of um, opportunities for microorganisms that are beneficial for production of fertility of soils to survive. And so essentially these are human created soils. Another colleague of mine, Michael Heckenberger, is working, he decided he'd work in an area no one worked before, in the upper Xingu area, where no one, pe people were telling him, oh, you're not gonna find anything up there, why go up there and waste your time? And he found incredible things, and he's been publishing a lot on this. This is from Scientific American, an article that he did of huge villages. Each one of those little houses there probably holds about 40 to 50 people. These are large, um, look like armories or something, you know, giant structures. and. Um, roadways that go out from these settlements to other settlements. Most of these are avenues that are almost as wide as the central bank of seats here with curbs along them, some of them perfectly straight, some not, that go to the next big urban center and to the next one. And after he surveyed for a decade or so in this area with his team, Brazilian team and, and students, he found that all of the big sites are lined on an axis, not perfectly north-south, but pretty close to it. And then perfect 90 degrees off of this are located smaller sites, all connected by roadways. So this indicates that these aren't little, simple, autonomous little communities, but they're interacting on a broad urban design, you could say. Then the other thing, the subject of this talk, are what we call geoglyphs or ring ditches, ditched enclosures. Closures have been many, many different names used for them. And these were um, first discovered over 100 years ago by some ethnographers and early archaeologists. But it wasn't until fairly recently, in the late 80s, that um, Ansu Ranzi um, started staring at Google Earth and some pre-Google Earth imagery and found, um, we now know that some 400 of these have been found in one state, the state of Acre in Bolivia, uh, I'm mean, sorry, in, in Brazil that borders on Bolivia, the area I'm talking about. Um, and these are just beautiful works, geometric shapes dug into the ground um, to be appreciated. That, well, today we find them because the ranchers are clearing off the dense tropical forest, but we assume that many of these, probably all of them, would have been exposed when they were built and in use. And we'll look at some of the implications of that in a few minutes. The ones I'll show you from Bolivia aren't quite as beautiful in terms of symmetry, but we have more of them, I think, and also um, much larger ones that you'll see in a few minutes. Um, um, most of us that do archaeology in the Amazon region are uh, also interested in the environment. And one of the things that archaeology can do is to tell us something about if humans had something to do with the environment, um, their role over long periods of time, thousands of years, um, to sort of say how biodiversity happened, and especially in the areas that we appreciate it today. And we kind of assumed that those are areas where there were no humans, but we're finding more and more that humans play an important role. So my colleagues and I are also historical ecologists, and we're interested in this long, complex human history of environments. And so most records that we have that historians work with go back maybe a couple hundred years, some areas thousands of years. Um, but they're usually not writing about the environment in those cases. Um, but archaeology provides an incredible window for looking at these things. And as you'll see, monumentality plays an important role in shaping and defining what we see and appreciate today in the tropical areas of Bolivia. Um, also, as an archaeologist, I study stuff. If, if people didn't leave something for me to study, I don't have a job. And so what we try to do is to sort of make sense of that stuff. And most, you know, you're familiar with the talks here at Penn, their collections, you know, pottery, lithics, and sometimes perishable materials, gold, silver. Um, but landscapes themselves also hold incredible records. And so in, in a sense, if, if humans did something over and over again, more, more than once, let's say, um, repetitively, like walk, to, from their house to their fields, or go visit their neighbors. All this stuff eventually, subtly, but eventually gets embedded right into the surface of the earth, sometimes in very complex ways. And so um, my colleagues and I tried to essentially read these landscapes to get at a whole realm of material culture and patterning and things produced by 
peoples of the past that um, most people kind of ignored until fairly recently. And what attracted me to the Amazon part of Bolivia, so this is the northeast corner of Bolivia, um, were features such as these where you have agricultural platforms, these are raised fields, and I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail in a minute, they could extend to the visible horizon. And if you fly over these sometimes, you could be traveling in a small airplane and have the pilot go fly low if I'm paying for it and photographing out the window. And you can go literally for 20 minutes sometimes and not see a break in these patterns produced by the prehistoric peoples of the past. And what these people are doing in probably any area of the world where humans have interacted with their environments is um, a concept we call domestication of landscape. And so in the Amazon, they domesticated few animals, they had a wide range of tree crops and uh, uh, plant foods that they domesticated and farmed, but um, didn't have the range of, say, animal species that you find in Africa, Asia, or Europe, um, if you look at the prehistory. And, but what they're doing is they're changing the environment. So they're not changing the genetics of the plants and animals, they're changing the environment to create habitats for the various animals and plants they desire. And so it doesn't really matter if they're wild or not, and the whole concept of something being wild really doesn't exist. They're changing the environment to get what they want. And you'll see this in a minute. So I work in what's called the Llanos de Mojos, so the Plains of Mojos, um, present-day department of the Beni in eastern Bolivia. And you can see here on this um, space image, you can see Lake Titicaca. If you've ever been to Peru, Bolivia, you see the dark area there in the lower left-hand corner. And um, this vast area of green. The dark green is canopy forest, and the lighter stuff is open savanna, or what we call pampa. And this is a flooded, seasonally flooded savanna. So the rains come for four or five months, starting about now, um, and rain continuously through April, sometimes into June, and then it all dries up. And so this creates an incredible dry landscape in what they would call the dry season, and a very, very wet, soggy landscape during the um, beginning of this time of year. So you can see on this landscape, you can see um, an old cutoff river, you know, water, sort of stagnant water. It's very covered with a couple of, sometimes just a couple of inches, sometimes several feet uh, along, especially the lower areas, especially rivers. But you can actually see some kind of straight lines and things in there. If you look at the center of the image, a little bit lower from the center, and then that weird straight thing there. And these are artificial patterns. These are not natural. And this is the kind of stuff that I look for. So the area I'm focusing on today is what we call um, Baures, and it's a very remote, until recently didn't have any roads to it, uh, along the Brazilian border. And um, it's a wonderful landscape, wonderful people. And um, this is what it looks like in, um, at the end of the rainy season. Um, so you see the savannas there, or, and these are sort of swamps this time of year, and then they dry out. And then the, what we call forest islands are slight rises in some areas, they're artificial. In this area, most of them are natural. And this is all maintained by burning. They burn and burn and burn. Today, the ranchers, to get rid of all the old grass, the old dry grass that isn't nutri nutritious for their animals, and um, the new grass comes up, and the animals get fat. Uh, in the past, they didn't have cattle, but they liked pampa deer and all these other animals that graze on those areas. And so uh, essentially they're creating, through burning, and we know they did this, because we wouldn't have these savannas in open areas unless they were burned regularly. So this probably goes back thousands of years, maybe even to the first peoples. And what they're doing with fire is not destructive, it's managing the landscape. And they're creating all of these different environments, a heterogeneous environment within an area that probably naturally, without burning and without human activities, would be kind of a simple landscape. The native peoples today, we assume, are some way re related to the peoples of the past that I'm studying you, I'm studying and I'll be showing tonight. Um, some people try to take certain groups and say, well, these are the ones that probably built the earthworks. Um, I'm a little more hesitant because we've lost lots of the records of the some 40 different uh, language groups that were in this area. Today, it's primarily two or three language groups. Um, but certainly, these are the living descendants of these societies. So I'm interested in earthworks of all kind. And 
the ones that we sort of started working on were the agricultural earthworks that you saw, and you'll see a few minutes, a few more in a few minutes. Um, my other colleagues are interested in traditional sites, so they're working on the settlement mounds. These are large, big bumps on the flat landscape where people piled up earth to live, and causeways and canals, all kinds of water management um, systems, uh, moving water from one place to another draining it in some cases, storing it in others with big reservoirs, and then the ring ditches or the geoglyphs that I'll talk about. And this was what we would call an anthropogenic landscape. This is, there's virtually nothing here that we can call natural. Everything has been churned, turned over, soil, sometimes several meters below the sur present day surface, uh, rearranging things, blocking water, bringing water where it wasn't before. And it kind of looks wild today if you fly over because there's so few people. Um, but as an archaeologist, we can now show that um, it was highly tampered with by humans. And so I was drawn studying these raised field systems. And so these, the lighter areas are slightly raised platforms. They won't flood during the rainy season. These are very badly eroded. And then the darker areas between them um, are or more humid grass, and those are what we call canals between them. And so as I had learned how to do archaeology, as most people did, in traditional sites. And so we applied many of the same techniques to the landscape. And so we dig trenches across these features. So you can see the slight rise of the fields that are going from top to bottom on this, and then the sort of swales or canals beside them where they took dirt out in the past and piled it up. And we cut these trenches across to provide windows, uh, sort of the inside of these. Sometimes we recover material that we can date. Sometimes they ate food there while they were building the fields, and it gets covered up, and we can maybe date a fire hearth where they cook their meal or something. Sometimes pottery gets thrown in as probably um, part of trash and organic matter that they're using to sustain the production. And the soils tell us a lot about um, their management and creation of new soils um, through this incredible system. And so in the 1990s, we did a number of experiments with some Bolivian agronomy colleagues to actually put fields back into use to study them, because none of them are used today. And this shows sort of the ideal model of the fields um, with during the rainy season with the water in the canals and the raised platforms, and then two communities that worked with us um, in the 1980s on some of these experiments. And here you can see why they were building these platforms. Um, in the upper image is the middle of the dry season. This is a very large field, probably bigger than most of them in terms of height. That's Bill Denovan standing on top who discovered these things. And um, then six months later, the exact same field in water and plants, uh, manioc and um, bananas. Um, we did a number of experiments, um, dry season, wet season, you see the contrast of how these things would work. And um, we found that you know, there was a, an interest in some of the local communities, but most of them are not, today are not interested in agriculture. They want salaried jobs, so a lot of the areas that we were working with in the early days in the 80s and 90s have moved to the cities, um, leaving many of these rural areas kind of somewhat unpopulated. But we did have some success in that a Bolivian project run by my colleague who's an uh, economist, Oscar Saavedra, actually worked with um, the European Economic Community, got funding to work with four communities, and they actually built their fields not by hand, but using machinery. And um, as far as I know, these are still thriving communities. And you can see they've got corn there growing on what is very poor soils, and they're producing the nutrients in the canals. That's actually um, blue-green algae and with water hyacinth that they scoop out of the canals, so let it grow there, scoop it out, and then mix it in as an organic amendment to the soils. So I'm interested in all kinds of patterns. And uh, one of the things that I turned to after the raised fields was looking at what we call landscapes of movement. And so you see here this straight kind of dark line that crosses the uh, savanna connecting the dark areas there are forest islands. And you can see a whole bunch of smaller lines, kind of most of them are perfectly straight there. So those are canals and um, uh, raised causeways. Uh, so platforms of earth raised up, some of them um, We've had a couple that are almost as wide as this room. Most of them are some like 10, 12 feet or so, and two or three feet high. And you can see how these things might work as roads. 
because you want to cross these flooded areas during the rainy season. And without trees on this area, you get burned up in the hot tropical sun when you're walking miles across this open, open area between your settlements. So you can see these lines, straight lines, and they're showing up as dark because trees are growing on there slightly higher and the, the periodic burns of the savanna leave those trees alone. So they show up as dark lines. In the past, they probably didn't have many trees on there. So here's how they would have worked. This is a reconstruction by Dan Brinkmeyer, a colleague of mine, does a lot of my artwork that you see in the talk. And so they're building a pedestrian walkway by raising it up, so you keep your feet dry, carry your stuff. They're wide enough so two or three people can pass each other easily. And they're using the canals alongside where they took the dirt out to build those things as waterways. And so um, you can skim these heavy dugout canoes across these areas carrying literally tons of produce or people. Um, and you don't need much water, just a skim of water, these things can slide across it. So another phenomenon we saw were these you know, weird straight features that we saw over and over and over again from the air. You can barely see them on the ground. And they're straight, they've got to be artificial. They sort of cross one over the top of the other in some cases. And they're not raised, they're slight depressions. And when you go look at them on the ground, they're about this deep, about this wide, just big enough for the base of one of those large canoes to pass. So we think they're using these as grand avenues, crisscrossing between the communities, their fields, and the ceremonial structures, um, or large earthwork structures we'll talk about in a few minutes. We use it to get around today um, at the end of the rainy season. For instance, how, how many of these do they need? So these are two forest islands, um, probably from one side to the other is about a mile or so uh, in measurement. And you see all those straight lines there between them. So something intense interaction is going on between those two high areas of high ground. So we map these things out. This is on old spy satellite imagery that we were able to get. It was declassified, and now we use Google Earth. But you can see the number of those. We try to sort of color code them by their sizes. And, um, found in that, that one image there, um, I think we gave up after counting 200 of these things. It's almost as if everybody had their own private route to go maybe visit their relatives or friends on the, on the other community. And um, we've mapped so far um, some 900 linear kilometers of these things, probably double or triple of that in the area. Um, many of them are well preserved, many of them are less so, but they're connecting forest islands in, in this schematic in the communities on them. We can do a quick Another thing we noticed is that they're changing rivers, they're changing the flood patterns here that we, all, we assumed were all natural. Um, and they're doing this through those same earthworks I just showed you. So this shows the savanna in, um, in the rainy season with about probably a foot of water on it. You can see these raised areas, those are causeways. And uh, we thought, well, maybe these things are blocking or controlling water. So this became apparent when I took a trip. I usually go in the dry season. We can get around easy. I went one time to take my dad down there in December, and it was after heavy rains. The roads turn into just a quagmire of mud. And I noticed as we had to dig our bus out and actually gave up, and we walked to another bus at the end of this thing, um, that one side of the road had water higher than the other side. I went, what's going on? This is almost a flat landscape. And the road, the engineers didn't put enough culverts in or drain pipes, they save money or something. And so the road is actually act acting as a low dam or dike to prevent the movement of water. Um, and so we started thinking, well, how could the raised fields and then all of these raised causeways and canals that crisscross them maybe be integrated into a system of controlling water locally, but also in some cases over large areas. And so we started playing around with all kinds of techniques of geographic information systems and things. There's a little schematic showing the water coming out of the river in the flood season from the sky during the rainy season and also encroaching from below as it sort of landscape gets filled with water. And what they're doing is they're sort of 
slicing up the landscape into these little, essentially little drainage basins, and they can open and close these things to get the optimal level of water. So do a real quick little animation here, sort of primitive version of one, to show you how this might work. So we have two rivers here. The rivers run sort of parallel to each other north-south. Along the rivers, they're carrying lots of sediment. So they tend to actually, the rivers tend to be sometimes perched or raised up above the surrounding landscape with all the sediment that flows all over their banks and gathers there along the ridges. So it's sort of high ground along the rivers, low areas, and high ground. And so during the, um, uh, the early um, wet season with the, with the rains, they're probably trying to capture the first rains so they can use this water um, for moving around in those canoes that you saw, but also for agricultural purposes. During the middle of the rainy season, they probably can't control it much because pretty much the whole landscape is covered with water. But they're also interested in extending their growing season and being able to move around the landscape. So they're actually sort of trapping water and holding it there for their purposes long into the, the dry season. And in most cases, these will eventually dry up for at least several months until the rains come the next year. So where do these people live? And I'm not that interested in archaeological sites, and there are plenty of other uh, archaeologists, my colleagues, that are interested in these things, so I sort of let them do the sites. And um, we know they lived on these large earthen mounds, similar to the tells of the Near East and other areas of the world, simply people living there, building it up a little bit, their buildings collapsing, building it up a little more. And so these represent thousands, maybe multiple thousands of years of accumulation. But the majority of these uh, where they lived are small little forest islands that are artificial. And you can see cows down there, little white dots or cows for scale. This one has um, a slight sort of area around it. If you know the plants, they're little aquatic plants. So it has a low area around almost like a moat. And that's where they took the soil to build up this surface um, that sustains trees today. And every one that we've tested, did a couple of excavations on these. We put cores through them. We always come up with human remains indicating um, that they, these were settlements. And one of my colleagues estimated there are 20,000 of these little forest islands across the savannas. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but you think each one might have been a hamlet or a village, maybe occupied at the same time, maybe not. That's a huge population. So in 2007, 2008, we generally work out on the savannas, but there was um, some massive floods, probably due to El Nino year, and so we, we tried to work in the savannas, and it was just too much work wading through water, knee deep and waist deep sometimes uh, each day. So he said, let's not work in the savannas this year. Let's go up on the drier forest islands. And so I did know that I eventually wanted to look at these so-called geoglyphs or ring ditches. And so this is one here in a small community called Hasiakiri. You can see the plaza today with some houses around to give you kind of a scale. It's about the size of a football field in the upper part and some roads. And then that circle there you see are tall trees growing in the ditch of uh, probably a medium size one of these earthworks. This is one um, in a fairly recently cleared uh, uh, field. And you, this is a D-shaped one. There are all different kinds of shapes and sizes of these. Um, this is an octagon-shaped one, which is interesting, and it actually has part of a ditch where they were going to expand it up there and make it larger that they gave up on, which is kind of interesting, sort of stopped the work. Um, they go by various names, as I mentioned. Um, generally, I'll use ring ditch in this, um, in this talk, and all kinds of different depths, forms, widths, and things like this. Um, I'll show you some of them. They also occur uh, together in groups and clusters. Um, so in this case, you see the D one I showed you there before. There's actually four, and we now know five here, all clustered together within stone's throw of each other. Why do they need so many of these things? Uh, were they all in use at once or, or not? And what's exciting is when we get back into the deeper forests, that they're much better preserved because the cattle and the erosion hasn't occurred there. And literally, you can almost fall into these things as you're going through the forest. They have these machete cutters, and they're cutting trails, and all of a sudden, they disappear in these deep, deep ditches that are not natural. So we, we're interested in um, figuring out sort of their dimensions is one thing, to look at issues of monumentality and the labor invested in these things. So we do simple cross-sections of them to figure out sort of what the cross-section is. Then we can multiply that by the distance of the ditch. And usually they're circular, they come all the way around in 
and sort of form a full circle. And then we can do some volumetric, uh, sort of calculate how many cubic yards or cubic meters of soil was moved in their construction. Um, this is doing a fairly deep one. Um, these are pretty easy to do, and my team can do four or five of these um, in a single ditch quickly, and then we move on to the next one. Um, this is a particularly deep one, well preserved in an area where it doesn't have ranching and a lot of erosion. Get a sense of what these things might have looked like in the past, but they, you know, they're, of course, they're at least 500, maybe more years old. Um, so even in these, substantial erosion has occurred. I leave my GPS on when we're doing a survey all the time as a nice memory card. So you can see our paths there as we move around the landscape, the purple lines. And then you can see where we found ring ditches. Many of these are known by the local people. Some of them we find on our own, um, showing um, uh, four or five of them on a single forest island. And there's almost, we can kind of predict if an island is a certain size, we can predict there'd be maybe one. If it's a certain size, predict there might be two or three. Usually they're on each end of a long linear island. And some, let's see. And so, you know, what do we know about the archaeology of these? So I've visited now almost 60 of these. And some of the ones in forests, you're not going to find much on the surface. You have to dig down. And we're not excavating these yet. But in the ones that are disturbed, we usually find pottery but not a whole lot. And compared to the settlements that I've visited many of these, the prehistoric settlements, they're chock full of pottery and all kinds of remains from people living there. So we were lucky in um, when a community decided to build a soccer field inside one of them. This is the one I showed, the first one I showed you uh, from Hasekiri. They brought a road grader in and they allowed us to kind of follow behind the grader and we carefully sort of found stuff, recorded it, bagged it. And what was interesting is that it's, that's, it's not the kind of stuff you would find in a typical settlement. These are our fancy pottery vessels. This is a, probably a beer drinking mug about this size, hold maybe a quart of traditional beer. And you know, highly decorated, the stuff you wouldn't see in most houses. Um, so it shows some, something special about these sites. Um, the locals will tell me, they'll go, Clark, we know what these things were for. And it's usually the old guys, and they'll go, we had lots of jaguars here in the past. Today, most of them have been killed off. And we had to protect our communities from the jaguars. And so we built these big, big ditches around the, um, the settlement so they wouldn't come in and steal our kids at night. And I think, oh, you know, that's kind of an interesting story. You know, build a big ditch for keep jaguars out. And how would we ever prove that if we wanted to? Um, and it wasn't until I went into a very remote area. I've never seen a jaguar in the wild. But we went to a very remote area where every single night you could hear them scouting us out in the dark around our camp. And there were at least four or five of them there. They kind of do this whoo kind of sound, um, kind of checking you out. And their, their prints are around our camp in the morning. And um, you know, there are a lot of jaguars out in some of these areas. So I started thinking about it more because I kept hearing it over and over again. Peter Stahl, who's an archaeozoologist working with animal bones, he came down to work with me. I said, Peter, could you do some research on jaguars? How far can they jump? He said, sure. You know, so he searched around the web. He found a manual of how to design zoos. And these are sort of the dimensions to create a zoo without fences. So you have essentially ditches, deep, deep ditches that you keep the animals in, and, you know, make them look more natural in a zoo. And it's almost the same size as what we find in the earthworks. Now, how would we ever prove this? You know, I, I guess find a jet, dead jaguar in the ditch or something, you know, doing an excavation. I don't I think it's impossible, but it's something interesting, you know, and the, the locals are convinced that this is what they're for. Another insight is we found in the more remote areas, every time we got into the deep forest, I could figure out we would find a ring ditch if, we, if I saw more than three chocolate trees. And if you can see three from where you're standing, you're going to find a ditch. And sure enough, inevitably, you will find one, maybe in five minutes, maybe a minute. And this is a, a ring ditch, a very badly eroded one, in a chocolate grove. Now, the locals call these wild chocolate groves, and they harvest them. Now the area is very famous for single-source chocolate, very high-quality chocolate. I think it's wonderful. I'm addicted to chocolate. And um, but the story is that Amazonian peoples didn't domesticate 
cacao for the chocolate. They didn't know how to do that. They drank a little low alcohol beer from the sweetened fruit, the pod that you see here. And it was the Maya in the far north in Central America and Mesoamerica that invented the techniques to extract what we love, well, chocolate. And it was reintroduced to South America as a cash crop by the Jesuits who were looking to make money um, in their operations of civilizing peoples of Amazonia and other parts. This indicates that maybe something else might be going on, especially this association with these ring ditches. So you could ask any archaeologist, I could ask you guys, you know, you come up with hundreds of different things that these ditches could have been used for. And commonly sort of assume that defense, you know, these are big constructions, they're deep, um, they surround something important maybe. Um, they're probably not settlements, maybe certain Powerful people lived in these things. It could have been cemeteries. We do find burial urns in these sometimes. Um, some people suggested water management. Now, one thing that I resisted for so long, that these are associated with warfare and defense of communities. And I started rereading some of the early Jesuit accounts from the area. And they're very rich, detailed documents by bored priests who were stuck there in the middle of nowhere who wrote lots of, about the communities they worked in. And they describe these kind of run-down palisades that are out in the forest, and associated in some cases with deep ditches. And they ask the locals, oh yeah, there was a lot of warfare here in the past. And now you guys have sort of you know, stopped the wars, and um, even though the Portuguese are coming across the border and attacking the communities and the Jesuit missions, but um, warfare had kind of died out. So I started thinking about this, and then a colleague of mine, um, uh, Fernando uh, Granero Santos, who's an ethno historian anthropologist, um, wrote a recent book, and he comes to the conclusion that in probably late prehistory, and certainly the early colonial period, in the areas the Europeans hadn't controlled yet, that some 40 to 60 percent of the indigenous population was a slave of another group. And that means, you know, lots of capturing of people. And we have lots of descriptions also from Europeans. Eyewitness accounts from military people, so they know what they're talking about. This is Hans Staden, who spent uh, kind of a very scary year with the Tupinamba. They tended to eat him, fatten him up and eat him, and on the coast of Brazil. And they lived in uh, palisaded communities. These are very stylized, almost cartoon-like structures. But you see these palisade walls uh, protecting the settlements, people with bows and arrows. And Schmidl, my favorite, is a German um, mercenary who worked uh, with the Spaniards in Buenos Aires and moved up into Paraguay, possibly Bolivia. And they fought every day with their mercenary uh, armies of indigenous peoples um, to conquer and enslave a community. They did it every day they go to a new community. Some of them they had to encircle, maybe besiege for a while. And thousands of people died and thousands were dragged into slavery. And then they move up the river to the next one. Um, so this probably was pretty widespread. Then I started thinking more and more as we went deeper into the forest, um, you know, that some of these are actually even difficult today after 500 or more years to get in and out of. And so they actually could have worked to keep human beings from crossing, especially if they had straight vertical sides, maybe some sharpened stakes at the bottom, um, or a bunch of poisonous snakes or a jaguar down there. Um, I mean, probably work as um, protection, or at least for a while. And then in the studies, we're interested in the, what we call energetics, is how much labor went into moving the earth to create these things. And if they were defensive and had palisades, what are the implications of that? One thing we noticed in some of them is the my machete guys are clear in the path. We walk down through the ditches to map them with the GPS. Is that you, the machete go ding, ding, kind of a real loud sound like it's hitting something really hard. And it's hitting rock. And most of this is dug through dirt. but Many of the deeper ones, the last three or four feet in some cases like this, is rock they're cutting through with probably wooden tools. Now, it's not granite. It's not you know, super dense material. It's kind of crumbly, but still an incredible amount of effort. Now, um, I haven't got a, my artist hasn't done me a great image like this, but I'm taking um, from some of my colleagues who work in the Mississippi Valley a palisaded reconstruction of a large a settlement. Um, so you can see, you can kind of get a sense here, and below is one of the um, ditches that we've mapped, one of our second and third largest. It covers a, about a square kilometer, about a half a square mile. 
of area. And so you think of the number of posts that we needed if you encircled this. And then we know from early Spanish accounts like this of Tupinamba villages, it's my, I should be French, um, of a palisaded village with guys with practicing their bows and arrows, fighting each other there, you know, a schematic thing, and all these stumps out there. And so it doesn't do any good to build a palisade wall if your enemies can sneak right up behind the trees, right? So you're probably clearing what you know, technically would be sort of a fire zone, you know, at least the, probably the distance of you shoot arrows around it um, if it's going to serve a defensive feature. So cutting trees down. OK, well, we have chainsaws. We use all kinds of equipment. Um, and these peoples did not have steel axes or iron axes or any axes except for stone axes. And these things are not as efficient as you know, our modern axes. I, uh, my first archaeology class was experimental archaeology. We cut down a tree, kind of bashed a tree down <laughs> using an old one that had been decommissioned from the museum. And um, you can do it. Oh, it's a lot of work. Um, and so this, uh, some experiments, and also done here at Penn, actually, and some um, ethnographic data about what, how much time it takes to cut trees down. And so for a, a medium-sized ring ditch, um, it would take to clear the area that enclosed the ditch and some kind of a zone around it to appreciate it or for defense. Um, it would be um, just to cut the trees down with stone axe, it would be 42 thousand person days. We're using five hours as a day. Just throw out a, some figures real quick here to get it. So digging the ditch, I thought that was going to be the most difficult. And we did lots of experiments with the raised fields of putting them back into use, carefully recording how much dirt a person can move in a typical day. And um, th so for that same ditch, it would probably be about 15,000 person days, a little bit less than the actual clearing of the trees. But that, you know, if they had to move the trees. So if it was forest before they built these things, the trees are right there. They cut them down, they're ready to use. But if these, as we expect, were fields and maybe overgrown forests, secondary forests, they might have had to move logs long distances. Now they could have done this during the rainy season using the rivers, sort of skimming them across the flooded savannas, but still it would have been a lot of work. Tropical areas, palisade posts don't last very long. So you've got to re if you need this thing for 20, 30 years, you're going to have to probably redo it. Um, so we looked at things like how, you know, if the palisade posts were relatively close to each other, how many posts would you need for, you know, a typical ditch? And um, so we, you know, from the Spanish accounts, there were some sort of shooting slits between the posts so they could shoot their arrows and stuff and protect themselves. Um, and you could probably, out of a typical tropical tree, get two posts that were high enough. And we have some Spanish descriptions of the actual height of these and how deeply they were buried in the, the colonial forts. And so um, clearing of the forest and the excavation of the ditch for a small, medium-sized one would be almost, um, 50, almost 58,000 person days. And there are hundreds of these things. Um, this is one dense concentration we have in Bowery's area. So the white areas are ditches, and the dark areas are sort of partial ditches. They're associated with them. We don't know if all these were in use at one time, but they're they're within stone's throw distance of each other. Why do they need so many of these things? And come back to this idea: they these peoples were probably under threat from uh, most likely the Tupi-speaking peoples. These are probably Arawak peoples. Um, so what do we know about these connections in these villages and stuff? If, you know, are they just protecting themselves, or are they all kind of working together? So the fact that these ditches, ditch phenomena is kind of widespread, there are certain kinds of stylistic similarities in terms of size and scale, that we think they're probably you know, working kind of together and coordinating a lot of this. Um, and they're doing it through the roadways that I showed you, the connections um, across waterways, some of these are artificial. So I had a student, a master's student, help me in this mindless work of staring at a computer screen and drawing any straight line we could find between the forest islands. So this and the lime green here are the forest islands, so one small area. And then those uh, orange and blue lines are different sizes of causeways and canals connecting them. I think we gave up to several thousand we counted. But this enabled us to then do some statistical analyses. And so he found a program called network analysis. Now it's kind of 
common use. But um, in the past, it was used to site um, shopping malls, you know, the best location where you have the most number of roadways and the highest populations, you predict the best place to seat these things. And it can be used for archaeological purposes to tell something about, is this, are all these connections across this landscape um, uh, 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 to integrate, or is there a lot of autonomy expressed by this, about, by the number of connections you see here between what we call nodes. And so he did this, ran this program several times and came up with a whole bunch of incredible data. So this shows uh, what we call uh, degree of centrality. And so the darker areas there are the ones that have more connections to them. And I thought it's got to be right in the middle of this mass of stuff. You know, there'd be a capital or something. There is one down here on the end, and those blue ones are a little bit larger. So they're kind of scattered out. So it kind of argues against maybe uh, being all centralized, but certainly a cosmopolitan people that are interacting with each other. So who are these peoples? Well, we know from the early eyewitness accounts, there were many different language groups. They fought with each other in some cases. They had huge villages, up to 10,000 in some cases. Very powerful chiefs in some of these societies that can mobilize lots of labor and, and warriors in times of need. And the Spanish described them as having, in many cases, gold and silver, which is not local. It probably came from the Incas, from the Andean region, um, but a very prosperous society. My Brazilian colleagues have been doing a lot of work and actually some excavations in their phenomenon of geoglyphs. And so they have now about 400 of these have been mapped in the state of Acre, uh, which borders with Bolivia, the area where I work. And you can see some of the um, different sizes and shapes here. And if you sort of kind of look at the distribution of these, they also extend in the area I showed you earlier in the talk with Michael Heckenberger in the upper Xingu, that it has this area we call Western Amazonia. And we're not arguing that it's a state, that it's some kind of civilization, but they're interacting intensely with each other, sharing a lot of things. And um, a lot of this is, has, has to do with earthworks. So we don't find it any kind of concentration elsewhere in the Amazonia or even in the Americas, except for the Incas. And my colleague Mike Heckenberger, you know, sort of do these kind of little silly lens-shaped diagrams here, but he's trying to show here uh, what he calls interactive spheres in Amazonia. And these are areas that he can define by pottery similarities, linguistic similarities, and what we know from the ethnographic and historical record and the archaeological record, that these are probably groups that are interacting more with themselves than the other areas that are marked here. But if you look at the scale of these, these are on par with anything you'd find in the Maya area, the Mississippi River here, the civilizations here, or in the Andean region. And dwarf, in some cases, uh, what we see as early states in Mesopotamia and China and other parts of the world. Um, we're not arguing that they're the same in any way, but um, certainly units that are much more than autonomous villages. And we know now from the raised fields that they're able to um, do incredible production. So in, in summary, I focused on a particular form of earthwork and showed the ring ditches are monumental in terms of labor invested in their construction and maintenance. One important question is what impact did the construction, in particular massive deforestation, of these landscape features have on the environment, and specifically biodiversity. Ecological surveys of the region of the forest islands where the ring ditches uh, are found have some of the highest biodiversity in the Bolivian Amazon. The same forest islands that um, are rich in economic species of plants and animals are still harvested sustainably by local communities, such as chocolate that I showed you. And if, peoples transformed what was a relatively homogeneous savanna and turned it into a terraformed cultural landscape of fields, canals, reservoirs, um, fish weirs in some cases, and these geoglyphs. They also, um, in these humanized landscapes, must have something to do with these present day resources. Despite the massive deforestation we required for the construction of these, whether they were forts, palisaded or not. Uh, these are, this isn't simply a forest recovering after the removal of native peoples from these landscapes due to war, disease, slavery, and relocation by Europeans. 
Like most Westerners, I appreciate trees, and I'm sure all of you do too. When I hear a chainsaw in my neighborhood of Bala Kenwood, it's, I cringe. And I you know, open the door to see where it's coming from, what big tree is coming down. And it just hurts me to see trees come down. But after working in the Bolivian Amazon for a number of years, I've come to appreciate a different kind of environmental aesthetic. For native peoples today, local farmers and ranchers, and probably the inhabitants of the past, a clean, wide open landscape of savanna is probably more valued than forests. They manage these through continual, annual, intensive burning to keep the forest at bay um, and created what their version of a proper cultural, orderly landscape. Cultural landscapes are records of the people without history, the 99% of the people living in the past who we don't read about. Uh, most of the accounts we have that are written from societies uh, come from documents about the elites. Um, and even though the reading of these landscapes is subtle, in some cases not so subtle, um, as you see in these landscapes, um, they're the signatures of productive human activity in these pre-Columbian communities, we argue, should be given credit for their accompli accomplishments, knowledge, engineering, heritage, and their monumental works. Thank you.